Hey everybody, how you doing? Well, that's good. Welcome to PHLY Flyers presented by Mortgage CS. Check out MortgageCS.com slash PHLY to start your home buying process today. Company NMLS ID number 1464766. My name is Bill Matz. I'm your director of fun and games for the evening. Joining me today, same crew, two days in a row. You love to see it. Man, off season starting strong. We have <laughs> Philadelphia's number one hockey beat reporter, Charlie O'Connor, and Broad Street Hockey's own, Kelly Hinkle, so we're a day removed, well, two days removed now from the uh, end of the Flyers season. The NHL regular season wraps up tonight with a few games. I think the whole Eastern Conference is done. It's just a few West games tonight, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, including the, uh, the debut of someone we might talk about a little bit later on in the show. Uh, but before we completely turn the page on the regular season, we are moving on. Uh, for anyone out there worried about where this content is going, we will not be stress stretching out exit interviews for weeks on end. I personally <clears throat> would argue, as someone who covers the team, I don't feel like the season is over until exit interviews are done and until we get the final interview with the GM and the coach. And those two interviews are tomorrow. So in my mind, like I am still very much in regular season mode today. I will not breathe a sigh of relief of, oh, it's the off season until I file my final story tomorrow on the Briere Torts interviews, because that has always, to me, felt like the true end of the season. I think tomorrow's the epilogue. The epilogue. That's the one at the end, right? The epilogue. Last day it's, of school for Charlie. Yeah. I, I, I hope it's the not... The prologue, the, the beginning. The yes. prologue is yeah. the epilogue. The, the epilogue. Yeah, I, just, I hope Pretty. it's not as long as the end of the Return of the King, Lord of the Rings movie, <laughs> because that epilogue was like an hour. Even the fucking trees in that movie walked. <laughs> uh, but before we turn the page on exit interviews, we I do want to go back to yesterday for a couple of things. Um, Charlie wanted to have a clip of Sean Couturier talking about his relationship with John Tortorella. He ended up summarizing it. I just think to get the full scope, we should play the clip. So it's like we're, we're not starting any sort of crazy, you know, like Charlie isn't misquoted or something. No. I just wanted to clean that up from yesterday. So it does seem like uh, you can judge for yourselves, but I don't think you misrepresented the quote okay. in any way, Charlie. Yeah. I'm glad you, you uh, just see in terms where I was coming of, from. Just in terms of Coots uh, on his relationship with Torts. But we're going to play that for you now and see what you think. We've agreed on some things and disagreed on other. It, uh, like I said, it's we don't have to agree on everything, but you know, as long as we work together and, and you know push for the same goal, that's all that matters. So that's that's I think that's the kind of relationship we have. Yeah. So the the way I described it in my story was he doesn't seem to be describing a bond as much as coexistence, at least where they're at right now. I don't think that is the worst thing. Yeah. I don't I don't suspect that Katuri is going to be engineering a mutiny against John Tortorella, but that quote does not speak to a strong rapport between captain and head no. coach. At least in my opinion. And I kind of I I don't I kind of get the vibe from Katuri that he would never be the guy to organize a mutiny. Like he just doesn't seem like that. I think he's kind too of, professional. Yes. Yeah. But I could see other players observing on his this behalf. relationship yeah. and then they just independently of anything Couturier says to them, forming their own opinion of John Tortorella that they don't really like. I will say like Couturier, that's Couturier's tone like almost every time I've heard him to talk. To be sure. Yeah, so yeah. I don't want to like try to interpret his tone. I will say during the season when these things were happening, he seemed like had a like pissier tone. And this one was more just like, 
listen, it is what it is. Yeah. We'll make it work. Yeah. yeah like, yeah. Well, like that makes sense. Yeah. The season's yeah. over now. Yeah. And what like, are you going to do? It was like, yeah, you know, I'm healthy. We'll see what the lineup is. <laughs> yeah. like, that was the I best don't know one. why I'm being benched, actually. Like you know? Like, but this is, this was more, more, I don't want to say, I don't want to say he was being unprofessional before. He was just telling you what he thought. Yeah. But this is, this was a more professional tone. I guess. Where I'm at is that I don't think this is necessarily a terrible thing if no. Katuri and Torts don't completely see it eye to eye, if this their yeah, relationship sure. isn't that of, you know, the like for example, Nick Felino was Tortorella's captain in Columbus, and those two were like joined at the hip. Like Felino was an extension of John Tortorella. I do not get the sense that right now. Sean Katuri is anywhere near an extension of no. John Tortorella. I'm curious to see where this goes. Because as I'm, and I said this in the press conference, I asked this to Gaturi about this, comparing it to the Travis Sanheim situation, where Travis Sanheim and Torts obviously butted heads at the end of last year with the scratch and the team kind of advocating on Sanheim's behalf that this was bullshit what you did, John. Sanheim and, and, and Chortorella had conversations in the offseason. They kind of, you know, cleared the air, got past it. Sanheim enters this, enters this season. He's playing the right side. He's getting heavy minutes. He gets to the, off to that incredible start. Mm -hmm. And even when his play dipped a bit in the second half, which it did, yeah. it absolutely did, John Tortorella still was nothing but complimentary towards Sanheim all year. I think that could happen. But sure. with Katuri, but it ha it, something has to be done to change the relationship because right now they're not there yet. Kutas Clearly. to challenge him to a fight. <clears throat> right. That's that's, the that's obviously yeah. the answer. I, I also think, too, and this was the other thing that did strike me as telling from the exit interviews by what it didn't say and what, what this person didn't say. So Kevin Kurz, who was diving in, I think this was one of the angles he was taking with his, his exit interview story, which is why he asked a lot of questions about this. He asked Scott Lawton, who before February was the only guy on the team with a letter. He's very clearly one of the team's big leaders. Yeah. I think it's probably the two two biggest leaders in this team are Sean Gatori and Scott Lawton. I, I think that is probably fair to say. Yeah. He was asked, Lawton was asked by Kevin, essentially, do you think that the Couturier scratching, you know, was a distraction? And <laughs> also, like, what do you guys, you know, do you think that that contributed to how at the end of the season played out. And it was notable to me that Lawton didn't outright say, no, it didn't have an impact. Mm. Like Lawton's answer was, yeah, it's tough. It's tough when your captain gets scratched. He's a leader of your team. You want him out there in key situations. And then he more or less said, look, it's our job to get past distractions. But he didn't shoot down the idea that like the team wasn't happy about it. And yeah. I thought that was notable because he could have. He could have been like, you know, that was a media created thing. We just, you know, we had blinders on. Obviously, we support Sean. He's our captain, but it didn't affect us. Whereas instead, Lawton, given the opportunity to say that, was like, nah, we wanted our captain out there. Yeah. And, and <laughs> we, I mean, and, everyone was speculated about that given the timing yeah. of the collapse. I, I, I thought it was noteworthy <laughs> by omission. Yeah, I agree. And this tells me, because remember, in those two games, they got three out of four points. Hmm. But this tells me after, like, the team responded, because I said it, that, like, this isn't just scratching Sean Couturier. When you scratch the captain, who is the representative of the team, you are sending a message to everybody. Yeah. Like, one, y'all are fucking up. This is, this is how bad things are. Like, I am doing this now. This tells me, like, there wasn't a conversation after. Like, we responded. We did our part. And then this was clearly a thing that we got to ask questions about. And then there was no, okay, listen, guys, we're through that now. Like there was, it doesn't seem like there, and, and maybe I, I that wouldn't happen there, with any coach. I don't think there was any resolution. Yeah. That said, I don't think John Tortorella feels like there needed to be. And that's right. but, but this, John this, Tortorella, yeah, yeah this, absolutely. This was always my concern about the captain, about the, the scratching of the captain thing. Number one, my concern was what's the reaction going to be in the short term? John Tortorella, undeniably, at least for those three or four games, got the reaction he wanted in the short term. He jolted the team. They started playing better. Then, obviously, they go into the eight-game losing streak. But they got that initial jolt. My other concern was, what could be the long-term effects of this? And 
I'm not saying that they will definitely be bad. There could be a resolution between the two, you know, Tortorella and Kateri in the offseason. It could be a Sandheim situation redux. That's possible. But as I said from the get-go, you're running the risk of creating a toxic relationship between the coach and the captain. And given the importance of the captain in terms of being like, I've heard this described by many people that many people that played in the NHL, that the captain is the conduit between the coach and the rest of the team. And if the conduit between the coach and the rest of the team doesn't particularly care for the coach, like that could create problems down the road. We will see if it does. It's just something that like we should keep an eye on because I don't think this is over in terms of what impact it could have long term on Tortorella's relationship with the group. That's just my opinion. That's like I look back to the Kevin Hayes situation Mm -hmm. and it's. Not even a an issue like he couldn't be here anymore, and it's because Kevin Hayes can't or won't play John Tortorella's hockey. Whatever he was asking him to do, not going to happen. Um, but that wasn't even the most toxic part of the issue. It was that Kevin Hayes is also a player with immense influence in yes. the locker room, yeah. uh, like well, and around like, the league for yeah, that, and matter. around the league, everyone yeah. likes Kevin Hayes. Yeah, everyone likes the Hayes family. Like everyone's friends with his dad. You know. Um, I, I see this could play out a certain way similar to that, but I don't think it, I don't think it has to like, I do think there can be resolution to this yeah. and it's, we're not talking about this still. If they don't go on the eight game losing streak. 100%. Yeah. No. Yeah. If they just played normally, well, we'd be talking about the playoffs right now. If yeah. they don't yeah. go on the eight game losing like, streak. If they just it. go 500 or <laughs> like, yeah. Right. Just go two and six. Yeah. Like, yeah. Two, yeah, yeah five yeah. and one. Yeah. They get, like, we're not talking. We're yeah. talking about the world. No. They, they get. They get a couple wins against the bad teams. They so got, they're in the playoffs right now. They, they get are. two five and one in that stretch. They're in the playoffs yeah. by a couple of points. Yeah. God, that's you're so not depressing. wrong. It's wild. It's, so it, so I do. We do have a super so, chat. Yeah. However, I want to get to the super I, chat. I don't. I actually, I don't want to get to the super chat yet. Okay. Because the super chat is about you know the overarching off season. And we're going to get to that. Okay. Oh. But it makes no sense for us to do the super chat when we still have exit interview Perfect. things to talk about. And we will be getting to VNet super chat in a bit. So VNet, hang so, tight. We're so getting there. If you if you were looking for uh, reasons to maybe become a diehard, it's because Charlie literally works around the clock. I saw him publish this story for diehards only at like two fifteen this morning. Yeah. Charles. Um, and it was his roundup as his takeaways from exit interviews. Uh, so if you want to read it all, if you want the comprehensive look, you got to become a diehard. Go to allphly.com. There's plenty of benefits. The number one is you get the number one beat reporter. Um, but I, So I don't want to give away the farm here. Pay for it. But yeah. it's, it's a very detailed yeah. story. Um, we're talking like, I think it, it closed out at like 3,800 words. So it has everything that you need to know about the exit interviews. We're not going to go into every single detail because, again, we'd love for you to become a diehard. Join the Discord. Get all the content from guys like Zach Berman and Bo Wolf and Kyle Newbeck and Derek Bodner and Jim Salisbury, who's doing, doing our Phillies coverage in part. Les Bowen is joining the crew. I think we got more coming. Yeah. We might have a uh, a story on a newly added Swede to the Flyers organization that kind of slipped through the cracks over the last week, but we just might be having an Alex Appleyard article coming Ooh, down the oh, pike for diehards good. only. So again, we'd love to have you join the diehard crew, but... Back to the exit interview stuff. So the the number one, because I did a 10 takeaways story on the exit interviews, and my number one takeaway was, because I thought this was by far the most interesting interview out of the bunch. Like some guys gave interesting tidbits. You had Drysdale give interesting tidbits. Couturier gave interesting tidbits. York revealed the uh, the grade two AC sprain that he had. So those are interesting pieces of information. I think the most interesting one was Eric Johnson just going, I'm not doing this. <laughs> <laughs> it was the night before. It's I, fine. No, I think it's fun. I think it's great. Like, this isn't my problem. I was here for two weeks. Yeah, it's like, I'm fair. not doing this. What do you want from me? It's fair. Yeah. But I thought the most interesting interview by far, the most telling and the most eloquent was from Garnet Hathaway. And Garnet Hathaway feels real good about this team. Mm. And I, I just want to read some quotes because these are the kind of quotes that speak to a trust, not just in the players from a talent standpoint, but in them as people. Mm. And I thought it was interesting to hear, and I'm going to get, after I read the quotes, I'm going to get into why I don't 
you, know, you always take things with a grain of salt. But I do think these hit me harder than they would have coming from even, say, someone like Sean Gattari or Scott Lawton. So first quote, guys are excited knowing just how much hard work it's going to take, which seems wild a little bit, but that's the kind of group this is. In a group like this where the work ethic, of the work ethic is already so high and you see that trust that we have in the locker room, the guys see how hard everyone's working. You can trust that the guy next to you, that they're going to do the same thing. He's basically saying that one of the reasons why he believes this organization is on an upward trajectory that is going to continue is because he has total faith that every guy is going to hit the weight room as hard as they possibly can this summer. Every guy is going to work their ass off to improve, including all the young guys who presumably still have untapped potential. And the reason why, number one, if you have a chance, watch it. The Flyers put it up on YouTube so you could watch the entire interview. Yeah, they're all there. I like to think that I'm pretty good at telling when someone is being sincere. And Garnet Hathaway was as sincere as I've seen a player speak in, in a while. Hmm. Like, he comes off as, like, full confidence that these guys are great and these guys are going to try as hard as they can to reach greatness. I think it was more important to hear that coming from someone like Garnet Hathaway than it is to hear it coming from someone like Sean Couturier or someone like Scott Lawton. And here's the reason. Those guys have been flyers for years. Yeah. They are fully invested in not just the flyers, but also all of the teammates. Mm -hmm. It's theirs. They, they, like... This is their world. And it's not even that they're lying. It's that I think they... They want to see the best yes. in the Flyers. They want to see the best in all of their buddies. Garnet Hathaway just got here. Yeah. Garnet Hathaway, not only that, Garnet Hathaway has played for like actually good teams. He's played for a Calgary team that finished finished with 107 points that had legitimate star talent. He played for a capital team that two years before won the freaking cup and had an all-time great in Alex Ovechkin and a Hall of Famer in Nicholas Backstrom. He played last year, and granted, I know they choked it away in the first round, but the team in Boston that broke the record for best regular yeah. season ever. He's played for not just, like, eh, good by flyer standards terms, <laughs> right. but, like, actually really actually good, good hockey yeah. teams. And he is speaking with the utmost sincerity and optimism about this group. That was noteworthy to me. Yeah, it's almost like getting an outsider perspective a little bit. on the team. Not completely, because he played no, for them yeah, this yeah. year. But more so than hearing it from Coots or hearing it from Danny Breer or Keith Jones. Right, yeah. No, it's... Yeah, like, coming from one of the leaders of this team, like, that's... Uh, it's almost a reflection of them. Like, yeah. These guys better work their asses off. Yeah. Otherwise, what am I doing as captain? When it's Garnet Hathaway, who's been in other locker rooms, sees how other good teams have done it, and looks at this one and goes... It is the right way. What yeah. they're doing is right. That yeah. does give me more confidence. It yeah. does. Like it's it. That is, um, like you said, it's not like those guys are lying. It's just like I take his word more seriously. Not like I take it more at face value than theirs. Like there's not yeah. an underlying. He's he's under contract here one more year. Yeah. He, like, he knows Sean he's not part of the long term is solution. Nine years longer than that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. You know. Um, before we move on to some uh, some other off season stuff, I got to tell you about our presenting sponsor. That's right, They're our back, pals baby. at Mortgage CS. They're back with us, and we couldn't be happier to have them. And it's the perfect time uh, for them to be back on this program because the spring purchase market is almost here, and it's heating up quickly. Many clients, especially first-time homebuyers, they're reaching out as they want to be ready when the rates drop. But this is what everyone is doing. That means there's going to be limited inventory and strong demand, so competition will remain extremely fierce for houses in the coming year. So you have to get in touch with Mortgage CS to prepare and ensure you will be able to stand out and make the strongest offers possible. Whether you're a first-time home buyer or you're looking to refinance, or you just want to know what you have to do to qualify for a mortgage when the time is right for you, Mortgage CS should be a consideration no matter your situation because Mortgage CS is made up of honest, good people that always work hard to not let their clients down. But don't take it from me. I've been telling you about them all season. Check out their reviews on Google. Spoiler, they average five stars, and that's the limit. Their average <laughs> is the limit. Uh, let's take a look at their most recent review from just two days ago. I just copied this into the outline before the show started. Just Google Mortgage CS. You'll find them. Click the reviews. They're right there. 
Five out of five would borrow again. They <laughs> shop it hard and their fees all come from the lender. We ended up saving 40, 40K plus in interest going with them. Wow. And in all the time, savings and help they provide throughout the loan and home buying process, I can't imagine doing this without Mortgage CS in my corner. I can't imagine doing this without Mortgage CS in my corner. Charlie and I... We've told you about the home buying process and how stren strenuous and it's stressful fun. strenuous and stressful it can be. I'm gonna tell you, like it's scary, man. <laughs> you yeah. need someone who knows what they're doing in your corner. Uh, so when you hear the word mortgage, think of Mortgage CS. Think of Ben and Alex. Save Ben's telephone number two six seven three nine one seven four two five to your phone. Email Ben Ben at mortgagecs.com. Call or text anytime, day or night. And if you're not in the housing market right now, but Maybe you will be sometime in the future. Just reach out and be like, hey, man, John Tortorella. What do you think about him and Coots? Are they going to patch it up? I bet you you get an answer. And check out mortgagecs.com slash PHLY to get started. This advertisement is not a commitment to lend or extend credit. Mortgage CS is an equal housing opportunity mortgage broker. All loans are subject to credit approval. Certain restrictions may apply. Company NMLS ID number 1464766. Visit mortgagecs.com for more information. And I, if you're if you're like me, I remember I began my home buying process right after the flyer season got done because I finally had time to do it. Maybe you're the same. Maybe you were just so invested in this yeah. flyer season <laughs> that you just couldn't You've add that one more to thing now. onto your plate. Yeah. Well, guess what? Every second day, you got four hours open now <laughs> because I'm going to say four because obviously all of you watched our post game show after every single game obviously. because you are great and wonderful people. <laughs> now you've got a bunch more free time that you can spend looking for houses. Yeah. And if you're going to do that, why not hit up Mortgage CS? Why not? You know? why not? What, what do you have to lose? Um, before, that's kind of the, uh, the exit interview our takeaways from that again become a diehard check out charlie's full column on uh you know four thousand words on the exit interviews i don't like come on that's worth it right there hey um but tomorrow we're going well you're going to get danny briere and john tortorella uh their kind of uh commencement speeches I indeed guess. indeed um they're they're wrap-ups so i think this is probably a good time to go to our super chat from oh, Vinet, perfect since this was Let's see we got from VNet. $10. Thank you very oh, much. Wow, way to go. Although the ending of year one of the rebuild was a bummer, I think the current group of guys deserve the opportunity to grow together for year two, i.e. no crazy changes. Hmm. Am I being naive? Love the show. Thank you, VNet. Oh, this man. is where we're at because we're going to we're gonna go into a lot more detail over the next month and a half about the pending offseason, about what might happen, but... In anticipation of Danny's final conversation with the uh, with the local media before he disappears for a few weeks and goes, I would assume, heavy into draft planning. This is when they have their their meetings with their scouts and really start putting together the big board. It's like late, late April, early May is when that really starts getting into high gear. But in the here and now, I think we can do a little bit of general talk about the the basic decisions that will have to be made going into this off season. Yeah. And like for me, if I was to be there tomorrow, which I'm not, you could, I'm not you could if you wanted to. <laughs> um, they would that, it's just like personally, what I want to know is did this season provide any information about the timeline in your head? Mm. Like I would like to ask Danny, like, you, you know, you and Jonesy, Tortorella, oh, the, you've all said the players will let us know what the yeah. timeline is. We just had an 82 game sample size. This is year one or year two of the, uh, of the rebuild, depending on if you're on John Tortorella's timeline or if you're on the, <laughs> this front office yeah. regime. It's a really timeline. good point. Yeah. Uh, it's, but, one or, it's year one or like, two. What information, and he, it's not like Danny Briere is going to say, well, actually I think, in 2028, 29, we're going to be in the conference final. Yeah. And then probably by 2031, I believe we're going to win the stand. Like, he's not going to say that. Shit. Of course not. I, like, that's ridiculous. Uh, but I just, like, want an idea of how, uh, is it this group and we need to supplement? Like, is it this group that we need to add a 1C2 and we're off to the races, do you think? Or is it, yeah, it's going to be another summer of a couple subtractions, a few maybe, like, key under the radar additions just to fill some 
Like, yeah, just someone to play on the power play. Yeah. It doesn't have to be an all-star, but like a guy who can score on the power play now and then, or at least run a power play, mm -hmm. something like that. Like, how are they going to actually attack this? And like, where are we in this thing? Is it still, well, next year, are the playoffs the goal next year? That's, yeah. You know, like they weren't the goal this year. Right. Yeah, they clearly weren't, but they might be next year. And that that's going to be interesting to hear. And maybe it's not an answer that he's going to be able to give until after the offseason plays out. Yeah. After he has a read on, you know, what moves actually were possible. They can have and 12 different targets. And if they don't get any of yeah. them or make anything, like well, we try. But yeah. just the fact, like if they do try, if and I don't, I don't expect them. For example, I have zero expectation that they are going to go into the off season and target like Sam Reiner in free agency. I, I think, surprised. I think they have made it abundantly clear they are not going to be dipping their toes into the high end UFA market yet. Yeah, I don't think that's going to change. However, I do think it's reasonable to wonder if they may dip their <laughs> toes into the high end trade market. Mm -hmm. Like that could be a thing, and that's something that. I know I will, and I suspect other writers will be trying to gather or at least garner some indication from Danny Briere tomorrow as to whether this season has expedited the timeline yeah. to the point where they feel like they can be or should be more aggressive this summer. Or, and I don't think they would ever reveal this, but like there are a lot of people in our chat a lot of people in my in the discord that we have a lot of people on twitter that like still think that they should blow it up mm -hmm. i don't think they're gonna do it but i guess in theory this season could have changed their minds and have them being like yeah we're gonna trade travis connecty i don't expect them to do that i think they're gonna try their damnedest to resign him and the only way they would trade him is if he doesn't want to resign or if he's asking for an insane amount of money but I gather that there are a lot of fans, particularly those that tend to frequent our comment section and our discord, that believe that that is the only path. And as a result, that is a question that should be asked because there's a lot of fans who think that is the right path. And Briere owes it to those fans to tell them why he doesn't think that is the right path. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I feel like all year we've been telling ourselves this team is going to be worse next year. Like, whatever they are this year, they're going to be worse. You, you guys year. have. I haven't been. All right, Charlie. Um, but it after this season, it's fair to ask, like, do they have to be? Because I don't think they do. I do feel like... I do feel like there's a surgical way to get this team to where it needs to be. It doesn't need to be big, huge, blow up -y moves That's, in order to get there. Uh, like... I believe that they're going to keep Travis Konechny. I don't know if it's the best idea. Uh, it probably isn't. But that's what I think is going to happen. Same. I yeah. still think there's a good chance. Not even worse next year. There's just like maybe a few more ro roster spots open for young guys to maybe jump into the lineup mm -hmm. and be more regular. That said, you also have to account for like, if Tyson Forster takes another step, if Bobby Brink is in the lineup every night and he's consistently a top nine forward, like doesn't disappear for a couple weeks at a time. Like mm -hmm. oh, if Owen Tippett has the breakout season next year, we all thought he was going to have this year. Like there's definitely ways for them to be better too. Yeah. Like if Sam Harrison doesn't have an 860 for a month, you know, like for right. 20 games and 860, that's a whole lot. Like, that's that's 10 backup, games you probably threw games. away right there. Yeah. Um, it, like, there's ways for them to be better, but I also see none of our prospects are great. It, like outside yeah. of Mitchkov, who I don't expect to see no. next season. And, that and would Bonk be a miracle. Maybe could, but he's a few years away. Basically. Yeah, and, and Bonk is also a few years away. Like none of the none of the dudes I expect or at least hope can step into the NHL next year are incredible difference making yeah no. like, like somebody no. in, our, in our comment section like here i want to see Emil andre yeah but... somebody in our comment section here just said like well they're gonna go out and they're gonna sign a power play quarterback but they have Emil andre i really like Emil andre that feels like a story. i strongly disagree that like Emil andre is gonna fix the fucking power play. that seems like unlikely. let's <laughs> let, let's let's lower it like just because yeah. it's the same people who were saying like well why don't they put Oli Luxell on the power play because he scores a lot of power play points in the ahl like i don't think Oli Luxell in any universe projects as a plus power play forward at the NHL level. They're com two completely different leagues. Yeah. I would like to see Emil Andre next year. I think if he has a strong camp, he very much will be in the mix. But I do not think that the answer here is 
bring Emil Andre up and the power play is fixed. Like, no. no. The power play will still be freaking terrible yeah. if Rocky Thompson is still the coach and the only change they make is replacing Cam York on the top power play with Emil Andre. It's still going to be real, real bad, guys. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you know what isn't real, real bad, though? It's Olipop. In fact, it's real, oh. real good. Uh, they were the presenting sponsor for our watch party the other day. Uh, so we had a little fun with Olipop and... I think I have discovered one of my new favorite cocktails. Oh. Strawberry vanilla Olipop. Hell yeah. I got to give that a go. tequila. I got to give that a go. Outstanding. Hmm. Uh, it was freaking delicious. I was, plan I was planning to do some some mixology with the Olipop once the season got done. Yeah. Once I have the ability on like an evening, I can like have a drink rather than be sitting in the press box. There you go. Um, that will be one I will test out early. Yeah, if you are drinking in the press box, if, if it's right? getting the endorsement, totally getting turned up. I mean, this isn't fifty <laughs> years ago when 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 guys are drinking old fashions while they're watching games. Why they not? Bring, they want to bring back like the way things yeah. were. You know, light up light up a cigarette like it's a special. <laughs> <laughs> I got burnt with a cigarette when I'm nine years old. There. Uh, anyway, what is Olipop? In case you're new to the program and you're like, what the hell are these guys talking about? Olipop is the world's first functional soda with a classic soda taste and the benefits of plant-based fiber, prebiotics, and other botanical ingredients to support gut health. Olipop is a new kind of soda with only two to five grams of sugar plus nine grams of fiber per can. Two out of three Americans say they suffer from digestive issues and 95% of Americans don't get the daily recommended amount of fiber. Olipop is tackling both of these issues with a drink that tastes just like soda. Prebiotic fiber is the food source for the beneficial probiotic bacteria in your gut, and Olipop has 9 grams of prebiotic fiber in every can that can help support your digestive health. And it's available online, and it's available in almost 30,000 retailers, including the most recent launch at Wawa. And one of the flavors they have at Wawa, that's right, it's my strawberry vanilla. You can go there, mix it with a little tequila. Oh, outstanding. Uh, this is, hey, these yo. are not the health benefits of Olipop. But honestly, if you're, <laughs> if you're using mixers... Yeah, it doesn't like, cancel them out. Yeah, it, you yeah. might as well, like... Yeah use a little bit healthier of a soda so why, why not? not give it a try well, and was i mean wasn't that the whole concept behind the whole marketing concept behind uh miller light back in the day miller light i believe they sponsor our uh, our philly show i yes. think our phillies, phillies and eagles phillies and eagles about the idea of like less filling but because it's less filling yeah it means you can drink more <laughs> absolutely <laughs> yeah. you can you can get even drunker with olipop uh, <laughs> <laughs> They're dropping us tomorrow. Uh, you, oh dear. you can, but before they do, make sure you get in on this. Uh, make sure you get on this promo code. Go to drinkolipop.com and use promo code PHLY20 for 20 20% 20 off your next order of Olipop. Discount only applies to one time orders, not subscriptions. It's also available on Amazon and in 30,000 retailers nationwide, including Wawa, Target, Sprouts, Wegman, Wegmans, ShopRite, and GoPuff. Drink your Olipop, fam. All right. And, and, and K-Red, they are not really competing beer sponsors because they're owned by the same parent company. Yeah, there's a whole weird thing. <laughs> there's seven corporations that control yeah. everything that we do, we, so we, it's fine. We drink the silver bullet <laughs> yeah. here. However— People all over the world. <laughs> we need LL. However, to however— shoot, yeah. Coors Light and Miller Light are owned by the same parent company, so it is not competition. It's, yeah. it's, if anything, it's a friendly competition. Good for them. Good Take for down them. Bud. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's probably all one company at this it point. Probably it's, is, yeah, it's three honestly. companies, but uh, they all golf together. Yeah. But uh, who the hell knows? So, so I want to go back a second <laughs> to the, every sponsor. I want to go back a second though to this power play conversation yeah, yeah, yeah. because I do think you know Keith Jones in a recent interview implied that I believe it was on the Anthony Organo show implied watch the anthony organo show just start it great morning show for those especially those who are more in the realm of like traditional uh sports talk radio you're not going to find a better traditional sports no, talk radio show than one. anthony gargano yeah. love that yeah. but anyway i believe recently anthony gargano had keith jones on the show and jonesy mentioned the idea of a power play quarterback now i generally speaking am hesitant to make any big free agent signings. I'm cool with some short-term signings, but nothing super long-term right now. And I'm also a bit hesitant to trade prime assets for anybody who isn't like between the ages of like 22 and 25, yeah. six-ish. Like to me, that doesn't make a lot of sense. However, I do understand the idea of prioritizing the power play for these reasons. Number one, 
personally, I would get a new power play coach. But if they are convinced that the coaching is not the problem, that it is the talent, they just don't have the right guys to make the power play work on the ice, that they could have Joe Mullen come out of retirement and it would still stink and to coach the power play. I understand why they would look at it as who could we possibly get to fix this thing. And by get, I mean like a player. Mm -hmm. Because I do think that, and this is something you spoke to from a different angle a few weeks ago, Bill, when you were talking about the goaltending. And you're like, it's hard to evaluate players when the goalies can't stop yeah. the puck. It's a, it's a bit harder to evaluate the forwards and their point totals and their offensive upside when the power play is like, historically bad there are so many guys guys like joel farabee like maybe joel farabee's end of year slump maybe he breaks out of it if they have a half decent power play and maybe he gets some points in the power play he starts feeling better about himself then it translates to five on five maybe travis konechny we're not talking about is he an elite elite player or not if he's on a power play that's any good and then he's finishing with 90 points instead of 70 there the power play, I do believe, and part of this is because the players aren't good enough, but there are a lot of guys I think they have on this roster, particularly up front, who would be really good second through fourth options on a power play, but they don't have guys that can really run the thing. I think Mitch Koff will ultimately be that guy, but I understand why they're looking at it and they're like, if we could find somebody who we could plug in there for a year or two has like a power play bridge to Mitchkoff who can help guys like Forrester score some power play points and guys like Tippett and guys like Farabee. And then we could see what they really are when they have some help on the power play. I understand why they are at least considering the idea of trying to solve the... Now for me, my solution would be Get Rocky Thompson off the coach, <laughs> get a guy to come in who has pedigree, and hopefully that yes. guy can get more out of the players they have. But if they have decided that it is not Rocky's fault and it's the players, I understand why they think that getting someone from the outside, it's not just a short-term move. It could pay long-term benefits in terms of the other players' development and what we think about their offensive ceilings. It's not... Technically, he's, I wouldn't call him a quarterback, um, but you know who's available? Who's that, Bill? Shane Gostas. <laughs> oh, he's pretty good. <laughs> just saying. Oh, that would be real. Kept. That would just we uh, we have a super chat. Yeah. I see. Um, look at that from Mike Beggs. Like the show. Thanks for loves the show. Bill loves the show. I can't see this. This is insane. <laughs> Maybe you could show it to the eye doctors, man. Uh, thanks so for all awesome season. For you. Question: Are the Flyers going to continue the tradition of addition by subtraction this off season? Any guesses who they would move on from? And we do have some mailbag questions, uh, kind of pertaining. Do you want to just that. jump right to the mailbag questions? Yeah, let's just go to the mailbag. Let's just jump right to the mailbag because that's questions. kind of uh, the, the theme of a lot of our mailbag questions. But thank you, Mike, uh, for the same one. Thank you very much. Let's go to uh, let's start it with filibusters question because this kind of gets to that. Uh, I can see the Flyers buying out Atkinson out of respect so he can continue his career elsewhere. But what about Peterson and Johansson? Do you think the Flyers buy out three guys this offseason? That would be wild. It'd be a little spicy. I, I could see it. I, I, if It really just depends on... Oh. I, really, what it depends on is is not this year, but next year. Yeah. Because you buy, you you buy wanna... guys out, that means you have... like These are all guys. Johansson, Peterson and Atkinson, who have one more year left on their deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To me, it's like in a vacuum, I understand why you would buy each of them out because like they're all either overpaid or bad or both. I understand why you would do that. However, if you then, because of buying out all three of those guys, you have an extra, and I haven't done the math in my head, but I will probably at some point, maybe you have an extra combined like $6 million on your cap in two years when I guess we're hoping things will be in yeah. better, a better situation from a talent standpoint yeah. than they are now. Like that's concerning to me. Some of these guys, I would think unless you're going to use all that cash space, you're freed up with the buyouts for something important as in like to trade for a guy who's 23 and expensive, like then cool. If you need to free up that space for that reason, I'm cool with it. But if you're just freeing up that space to like go, 
like add like more Garnet Hathaway. Yeah, or yeah. or like you take on a a Nate Schmidt and get a second round pick for, for it. Like I'm not I'm not cool with that. Like if you're if you're clearing up the space to get somebody who will legitimately help this team for the future, I'm cool with it. If you're doing it just to do it, not a huge fan. However, the real part of this this question I want to dive into is the Cam Atkinson question. Because well, first I want to Ryan Johansson is injured. He's injured. Yeah. But he's injured. Uh, and yeah. you can't be bought out. That is true. He does not want to settle for two thirds of the money. He wants all of that money. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he is. That I'm, guy seems like a I, real. I, I, listen, I would do the same a real shit. gem. Yeah. Listen, I would do the exact same I thing, mean, especially no, if a team sure. traded yeah. for me that doesn't want me. Yeah. I mean, they made it very clear they didn't want him. Like, oh, like, you, I'll be an asshole too. I don't yeah. need to play next year. Like, you got to pay me either way. My mm. back hurts. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it. But Sorry. Like, so I think that Ruptured is spleen. I think that Whatever. is kind of that might be the one they have to eat. Mm. The Cam Atkinson thing uh, and like Cal Peterson, I don't know. They'll probably just keep him buried. I, 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 I would just keep him. Like yeah, I would just through it. I would just get keep through him. the deal, yeah. send him down to the minors, get the cap the one million dollar ish in cap relief for having him in the minors all year because like nobody's gonna fucking claim him. Everybody no. knows he's terrible now. And then just deal with it. So I wouldn't necessarily buy him out. Mm -mm. Uh, Johansson, I probably would because they've made it clear that they don't want him. Atkinson is the interesting one. So now we get to Cam Atkinson because this was a topic of conversation at exit interviews that we have purposely kept to now because we knew we had this question coming. Cam Atkinson did not speak as a player who thinks his career is over. No, he didn't. He very much spoke as someone who, and I will quote him, I still feel like I have a lot of juice left in the tank for the right situation. Oh. Those those two words, wow. right situation, are very interesting to me because yes. Cam Magazine is not going to come right out and say that, hey, I just had my exit interview with Danny Breer and he told me you're not part of this. But to say right situation rather than here no. makes me wonder if he kind of knows that like his time in Philly's over and he's going to have to prove the haters wrong yeah. somewhere else. It's very interesting because I'm not sure how much better a situation could have been for him. Yeah. I mean, the coach here loves him. It's a reasonable point. He was getting a ton of opportunities to fix his shit, and he just didn't. He got a very long leash. Yeah. And so... Uh, On January 23rd against the Tampa Bay Lightning, Cam Atkinson scored a goal and an assist. He played 23 games after that. Yeah. He recorded no goals and no assists. Yikes. That seems hard to do. Eric Johnson scored two goals in that amount That's of time. Just, how does it not even hit you, know, Johnson you in the did ass get, and one time? Johnson did end up with an assist, so we didn't get the uh, the 5-0 stat line. He got nice. an assist uh, mm. against, yeah. I forget who. But anyway. Bill, no, Bill like, we got a quick little super chat from Daft Diggit. We got $5 to your needs binoculars fund. I don't maybe just the <laughs> glare on the screen. Like I've had perfect vision my entire life, and like the last couple of weeks, I suddenly can't. D did the screen used to be bigger? <laughs> no, it's your, it's all you. Your man. eyeballs do be getting worse when you get old. So <laughs> ah, see, I can read that. There you go. That's better. <laughs> our, our, our great producer, our great yeah. producer Britta, for those who can't she see, which is, which is everyone that isn't in this room. She just increased the size of the yeah. of the the screen that where we can see ourselves, and then yeah. overlaid it on top. Top uh, of the group, the, the, I, the yeah, chat. I, so I can there, see like there is that option. Thank you very much, Britta. Yeah, no, she just made it the like the old the old person the old font person on the on iPhone. iPhone. Yeah. yeah, no, that's that's what it became. <laughs> I'm just gonna be helping Bill. Yeah. Bill's Bill, you're what like eight months older than me. I'm gonna be like, oh, here <laughs> you go, Grandpa. <laughs> gonna need to run home. <laughs> uh, so uh, the right situation for Cam Atkinson is it. Just like back in Columbus, it's like I think that would be the ideal. I'm sure he would love that. I just, I mean, they don't really know what What's they're his... going to do yet. I don't think they've hired a GM, you know, since firing Kekalainen. So they still need to make a decision as to what their direction actually is. Like from what I've heard, their ownership is kind of crazy. So it's not out of the realm of possibility they hire a GM who is tasked with like still trying to squeeze blood out of the stone Oof. because they still got Johnny Goudreau and Zach Wierenski, And it's like, no, we got to win now rather than like, yo, this team is real bad and we need to, to pivot a little bit because if they do pivot to the, a couple years of being bad kind of rebuild, 
Cam Atkinson, to me, would make perfect sense. He's beloved there. Mm -hmm. He loves Columbus. He still pretty much has all of his roots there. I'm sure he would love to finish out his career on the team that he views as his NHL team. I think that would be great, but I don't know if even Columbus would take on that entire cap hit or anything. General manager Cam Atkinson. Ooh. In order to player like, general manager yeah, Cam no, Atkinson. Yeah. Uh if the Flyers were to say cover 50% of the final year of Cam Atkinson's mm-hmm. contract. Bill, I don't even know if that would do it. That's it would come down to about 2.94 million. That's still a lot for, yeah, for what I he provided in the second half. I think you might have to like throw in a draft pick to a yeah, third party would, broker. You would to, have to ghost him to take on a fifty of the fifty. Or or, like, or retain it and give like, you know. We're to do 50% retention and give you a fourth round pick yeah. to take on camp. We're going to retain, someone else is going to retain, and we have to give you a draft. Like, yeah, yeah. It's going to take, I, I just. Well, we do have a. a he looks like nothing. We do have a much more creative GM in Philadelphia yes, than we have for quite true. a while. So perhaps if Danny Briere is going into the offseason, and I, I have a hunch he is operating under the assumption that Cam Atkinson cannot be part of this team next year, perhaps he can find a creative solution to solving the Cam Atkinson problem because I do believe there is still a lot of respect for Cam Atkinson, the person, and even Cam Atkinson, the player. Obviously, he has the great relationship with Torts. I asked Cam Atkinson specifically about whether that relationship was tested in the second half Mm. when Tortorella scratched him a bunch. And more or less what Atkinson said was, we have a special relationship. Yes, this has been hard, but I'm not going to let this ruin what is a really close friendship between player and coach Aww. i'm sure that really sweet, atkinson thinks that torts is wrong yeah, yeah, that yeah. atkinson sure. believes he still is a good player and can be productive but i think and i say this with uh, i i have a lot of respect for cam atkinson he's been nothing but great to cover i think in this case torts is right and i think in five years when cam atkinson is officially retired and has a chance to kind of settle down and look at it with a clear eye he will look back and realize that he wasn't ready to accept that he was probably finished but he was probably finished yeah yeah yeah. i will say like maybe as a part-time player and like a bottom six role because he did start the season with eight eight goals in 15 games he had that other stretch of uh what two three four five goals in like seven games he did have some jump at points this season. Like maybe if you it just lessen, yeah, it's just, it ended so bad. I would like to see if he can, with the, the benefit of a full off season, not having missed the entire year prior, if he can revitalize his career, I will be rooting for him. Absolutely. I will a hundred percent be rooting for him to show that he still has gas left in the tank. I also just know how the aging curve works. Yeah. He turns 35 in June. If he were to get back going next year and become a, you know, even just like a guy who scores 17, 18 goals and is a useful cog on a incredible. team, yeah. I will be so happy for him. Yeah. And I will be like, you know what, Cam, you proved us all wrong and good for you. Right. It's just that I don't think the Flyers can depend upon that happening. After no. after what they saw this season. And like, no. what's the point? Yeah. Okay, so he bounces back. And now he's a UFA at yeah. 36. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah right. well, who did, what did this do for anybody? Yeah. Like, On a like, team that has no chance to win the Stanley Cup. Yeah, like, wow. to me, the idea of bringing back Atkinson and giving him another shot to show that he can revitalize his career, what that by virtue of the roster probably means is that like Bobby Brink ain't an every night player in his second year in the NHL. Samu Tuamala has zero chance of making the team. It just doesn't make any sense to me. They already have too many right shot wingers. Yep. And now they have this 35 year old who couldn't even get in the lineup for most of the second half. Like it doesn't make any sense for the flyers to have him. He's boys with the coach and in game 82 in a must win situation, he played like four and a half minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Nick Delorier would have played more last night or two nights ago, whenever it was. And again, <laughs> if I will be rooting for Cam Atkinson to prove us all wrong and show yeah. that he saw something left in the tank, uh, I just don't think it makes any sense for him to get that opportunity. A here. perfect situation for him. You know, they're looking for veterans. They're looking for a good mix. I'm telling you. 
You could do something with Buffalo. There's some <laughs> way to take Somewhere. advantage of the stupidity of Buffalo. Uh. We could get one of the high-end pieces we need from them because they give up on somebody too soon. I'm not saying it's like one for one with Cam Atkinson. No. I'm just saying he, do a little you need a guy like him. He's a leader, man. Uh, Cam Atkinson, you know what he's hoping to say next year? That it's game time. Hey and it's yo. game time hey. for anyone out there looking for tickets to the next upcoming events. you got to use the Game Time app because Game Time is the place for last minute ticket deals. You know about the killer last minute deals. Plus, they have the all in pricing. See what it's going to cost before you like click five screens and you bought it and you go, oh my God, there's 20 <laughs> more fees on there than I thought. Nope. <laughs> They're up front with the pricing. You get view from your seats and they have the lowest price guarantee. If you can find the if you can find tickets in the same section of row for less, Game Time. Game time <laughs> will credit you 110% of the difference. They take the guesswork out of buying tickets. You can save up to 60% buying last minute for sports, concerts, comedy, and theater with game time. And you can save even more with exclusive in-app deals on select seats ahead of the game or event. So snag the tickets without the stress with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, use code PHLY for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code PHLY for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Yeah, the, what happens with Atkinson is going to be so interesting. It would be just because we know yeah. how much respect yeah. they have for yeah. him, and the coach does have a lot of say. Also, the coach was like, "Was not playing. I can't play this guy." Yeah. I, I do not know in what way Cam Atkinson won't be on this team next year, but it is very difficult for me to imagine that in the end Cam Atkinson is on the team next year. I don't know yeah. whether it's going to be a and, buyout or a trade, but I just don't think that's in the cards. I just don't. It doesn't make any sense. It really. does not. That kind of gets us to uh, praise the pucks question. If you had to guess any players on the roster that aren't unrestricted free agents that won't be here next year, who would it be? Yeah, I mean, Atkinson is the obvious answer, to yeah. be sure. Atkinson, but I think, is the most obvious. Also, I feel like, getting to your point about Game 82 must win, Morgan Frost is benched for half the game. Like, it still seems like, even though he had what I think was a pretty good year, yeah. John Tortorella still doesn't trust him and still doesn't like him as a player. So I could see him being a piece in a hockey trade. Oh, that, in, a, in a hockey trade, absolutely. Yeah. I think especially if they end up trading for a center. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He would, I would assume, be part of it just because right. he's on a cheap deal. It, it, presumably the team who's trading away the center is trading away a guy who is more expensive. So this mm -hmm. allows them to fill that gap with a much cheaper player who is very clearly at least a solid NHLer. Yeah. Morgan Frost is, I believe. I think we all can agree that yeah. he's established himself as a perfectly fine NHL player. Absolutely. I think that would make sense. I, however, do not think that game 82 means that the Flyers are out again on Morgan Frost. I don't know that the Flyers are. I think John Tortorella is out on I think Morgan Frost, Frost might go, I'm fucking out on this. Yeah. I've I wouldn't had blame him. Like, like, yeah. Uh, he'll be I, I, I just, I see the thing with Morgan Frost, though, is, and this is, this really, like, maybe this is partially by design, but I also think they also may have kind of, like, stumbled ass backwards into it. I think there are a lot of players on this team that if the guys didn't love each other so much, they would want out. Like Morgan Frost has every reason to be like, I am sick of this frigging coach, yeah. but he is so tight with everybody on the team that like, he might not like playing for torts, but he loves playing he with playing the with guys. Them. Yeah. Morgan Frost. And just like as a valuable asset, because I know a lot of people out there like, oh, it's going to be a hockey trade. What the hell are we going to get back from Morgan Fro Frost? And maybe you're underrating him. Maybe you're properly rating him. I will say though, he turns 25 in about a month. And he signed for one more year at $2.1 million. And he's still under team control after that. He's got another year of restricted free agency. It's like just as a valuable asset, it's like, hey, here's a cheap guy who can give us at least 40 points. And um, he's ours. Like, we're not, we're not going to have to give him $7 million anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I could see him fetching a decent return. Not anything crazy, but... That I mean, the pick know. for something like could get Not you like a one for one yeah. thing. Like no. I could see him being part of a package. In part of a package. Yeah. An another guy. I don't who, expect him trading. Another guy who I think, and again, like I personally do not want him traded, but I do think that the 
the post All Star break performance and results of Joel Farabee mm. make him a more palatable potential trade option in a hockey trade. Because again, if you're going to make a hockey trade for a potential impact player in his prime, you're going to have to give up stuff yes. of value. Yeah. You can't I, just be our trash. Let me put it this way. Like during Hang the year, I, my, my guy who I had in my head of like who they might move would be like a Cam York because you mm-hmm. know, they got guys like Emil Andre coming who play the left side. They have Oliver Bonk. Like maybe York is the guy who ultimately is expendable. I think after the way he played in the second half, I do not think they will ever, they will view him as expendable. I no. think they view him as a core piece. Yeah. Whereas while Cam York stepped up at the end of the season, Joel Farabee stepped back. He sure did. And suddenly maybe he's the guy where if you're talking about adding a big piece, maybe he's the guy where you don't want to move him, but suddenly it's, it feels more acceptable in your head to move him because maybe he's not as good as you thought he was in January. I think, um, I think it's likely Lawton and Risto are gone. Okay. All right. Risto. Risto. Like if we ever get, I mean, no one's going to trade for a dude who's like, yeah, he's on Ellis Island. Right. Like if there's ever any clarity about his injury and how healthy he is, like that's a big caveat there. Yeah. But I just think at this point now, I love Scott Lawton. At this point now, now he's we have Ryan Paling, we have go. Garnett. Yeah. How many of these dudes can you have? We need roster spots yeah. for young players, even if like maybe they're not blue chip prospects, like young guys who might ultimately be better than Scott Lawton. Right. The only way to find out if think about how long it took Scott Lawton to break out. We need to give guys that opportunity yes. that he got if we're going to turn them into the next Scott Lawton. You're right. I, yeah, like. I need to see some dramatic change here. Listen, yeah, I think the team took steps. I think this culture is probably strong, as Charlie's saying. The guys all love each other. Garnett Hathaway is saying how solid it is, like how solid his teammates are, and that's all well and good. Fact of the matter is they've missed the playoffs for four years in a row, and they fell apart down the stretch. I I think that, to me, is the big thing, is that I am not of the belief that all this culture stuff is bullshit and it's irrelevant and it's an invented fiction by the Flyers meant to pull the wool over eye over our eyes about how bad of a team they are. I do not think any of that is true. What I do think, though, and I said this on a couple shows, what I do think is that this eight-game losing streak at the end of the year showed you that the culture thing isn't a cure-all. It's not enough, yeah. Like, like they, I do believe they have a strong culture. I also believe that if culture was as strong as they... Not not their culture, but just culture in general. Generally, if yeah. culture was as important as they have claimed it is, they wouldn't have choked this playoff spot away. Yeah. I think the culture thing is like the base that you build on. Yes, I agree. Yeah. I just like, it's a lot like captains. You know is a good culture? Winners. Winning team. Yeah, <laughs> yep. Exactly. Yeah, like, you know where the culture sucks? Ottawa, Losers. Yeah. Buffalo. Like teams where you're perpetual losers. It, it's a chicken like, and egg thing to yeah. be sure. Because it's like, are you good because your culture is good or is the culture good because you're good? There are good teams with shit culture. Yeah. To be sure. There are there are teams with good players that have shit culture. Yes. And I guess that's the argument against like Buffalo or Ottawa. Yes. Like they should be better, like, regardless if you think they're cup contenders or not. They should be better they than missing be better. the playoffs by the amount they're missing the playoffs yes. by. You know, and that's the that's the reason I guess the Flyers are doing it the way they're doing. I don't hate the I just think like how strong is the culture if every guy on the roster has to be a culture guy? Yeah. Like it, it can't take losing a Scott Lawton. I don't know, man. Like I just I think that's a change that could not even be addition by subtraction, but just be good for the growth of the group. Maybe. Someone else step up now. Yeah. Scott Lawton was one of your leaders. Someone else take the reins. Maybe. Uh, let's try to get one more in before we get out of here. All right. Um, yeah, let's go to Idiot Sandwich. Uh, in addition to Drysdale re-engineering his game over the offseason, what are the two to three other focuses for key players' development this summer? That's a good question. He references Frost shooting, Forster skating, things like that. Hmm. That's a good question. Um, a forester skating, definitely. Yeah. And I, I don't think it's bad. I think he's worked very hard to improve it to the point where it is passable. I would love if it just got, you know, 15% better. If he just had that little bit of a more burst, mm-hmm. because I think he's so good at everything else that 
even minor gains will have an exponentially large impact because he's so good at the shooting. He's mm-hmm. so good at the wall play. He's so good at the positioning that if he were to just get a little bit quicker, like a, one guy who I, who I equate this to is like Braden Point. When Braden mm-hmm. Point was, and I do obviously these are two completely different players. When Braden Point was drafted, one of the reasons why he slipped to the third round other than his height was that he wasn't a great skater. He then over the next five, six years turned himself into a great skater. I do not think that Tyson Forrester will ever become a great skater, but like Braden point had everything else other than size and skating. And then when the skating went from like slightly below average to significantly above average, Mm -hmm. he then became like, in my mind, one of the 20 best players in the NHL because he had everything else. Tyson Forrester, Pretty much has everything else. He's if he can, if he can get a little bit better at skating, even a little, I think that'll pay major dividends. So he's one. I am looking at a guy who is already pretty damn good at scoring goals in Owen Tippett. Okay, he's got a. He has great velocity on his shot. Mm-hmm. He seems to be able to get to the net when he wants to. Um, but last year was the best year of his career shooting percentage wise, eleven point seven. This year, he shot 9.7. Mm. Uh, for comparison's sake, Tyson Forster's shot 12%. Oh, and now you're going to be, you're not just guy with great potential. You're now guy making 6.2 million yeah. for the foreseeable future. That's fair. Let's get to 15. That's... Whether it's you got to get to the net more and get some rebounds, like to boost those numbers up, score a little more on the power play, get that shot away. I saw him take a few... Uh, so I'm take a few slap shot one timers uh, from the OV spot uh, in the recent in like the late end of the season. Maybe that's something you can work on. But just mm-hmm. some like I need you to score 35 goals, dude, to justify the 6.2 million. Yeah, like you need to be a little more consistent, and that shooting percentage needs to be at a, a few points higher. Let's get to 15 here. I'm not asking for the world. I think that's reasonable, and especially because that's what Matt Reed shot his first yeah. three years in the league. Well. It- he could make big gains. I'm not even saying 15%. If he could if he could get to 12%, because he's become, as you noted, one of the highest volume shooters yeah, of the NHL good. level. Yeah. If you keep that volume, but you finish on 4% more of your shots, suddenly you easily clear 30 goals rather than being right at that threshold. Yeah. And that's important. So that's a guy I would like to see. Jamie Drysdale. He's got to get bigger. You just got to do... I, I worry that whatever Is that surgery... Your, is that yours, Kelly, Jamie Drysdale? Yeah, it... I would like to see him get stronger, but I worry that whatever surgery he's got to have might keep him from hitting the weights as hard as he could otherwise. Hopefully that'll be information that Danny will give us tomorrow. Yeah. And maybe he'll reveal the the nature of this supposed surgery and also the, um, you know, just like the time frame of the surgery. Because some surgeries, you know, it's not that long. Yeah. You maybe have to sit around for a month and then you're good to go. I would also like to see Bobby Brink work on some stuff. Like he's got, I feel like, good tools, but the consistency is not there at all. And so I don't know if that's him working on his shooting or getting stronger so he's not beat off the Some of it's just... Oh, so, so we do have a, a piece of news that just dropped. Oh. Uh, not, nothing like, you know, earth-shattering in the sense of a trade or anything. Uh, injury update on Rasterus Alignum from Flyers Twitter. He underwent surgery on a ruptured tricep tendon. He's expected to be out three months. We'll make a full recovery. Expected to be ready for the start of the 2024 training camp. That's a Man. ruptured tricep tendon. Why did he? Cody get- Rhodes fought in a hell in a cell with a torn tricep. He couldn't play a couple <laughs> NHL games. I, Come on. I don't understand. Like, why would you have gotten that surgery three months ago? You've been out the whole season. Like, what? That is what a are great question. Uh, like, I they always seem to do that, and uh, I don't he's understand. Like, I can it. play in the playoffs with this. <laughs> yeah, what are you gonna do? Just like, can you <laughs> put a staple in it or something? Like, uh, why not just get it? Bef- well, whatever. Uh, doesn't matter. Know, just waiting. Just yeah. waiting for this time of year. You know. Yeah. Uh, and it is. I, it, I, I guess the question. Are you gonna go into an ad? I, I was gonna do. Go the into right an ad. We'll talk yeah, a little bit more about Risto it's, before we close it out. It's that time of year. Birds are chirping. Grass is growing. Hockey playoffs are here, and that means eyes are watering and throats are scratchy. It's uh, true. Everyone out there who's been listening to the show for the last few weeks and months, knows I'm an allergy sufferer. Uh, You can hear it in my voice on plenty of days. Listen, pollen from trees, 
grasses and weeds, they're a primary cause of seasonal allergies. Symptoms flare up when the pollen, uh, when the pollen you are allergic to is in the air, and it's possible to be allergic to just one or several different types, and it sucks, plain and simple. But there are steps you can take to help alleviate some of your allergy symptoms. First and firm, foremost, sign up for Rite Aid Rewards emails at RiteAid.com slash rewards to receive email pollen alerts for your area. Pollen count is high. Yeah, try staying indoors. Keep windows closed and run air conditioners as needed. Remove shoes, shoes and coats near your door to minimize tracking pollen inside your home. And take a shower before bedtime to help wash away pollen from your skin and hair. And, of course, you can visit Rite Aid to stock up on over-the-counter allergy solutions like nasal rinses and antihistamines. Still not enough relief? Ask a Rite Aid pharmacist if a different type of allergy medication, like a decongestant, might be necessary. You can always ask your Rite Aid pharmacist for recommendations on ways to get relief during allergy season. Visit your local, local Rite Aid today, stock up on allergy relief, or to catch up on immunization for RSV, shingles, and more. Walk in or schedule a vaccine appointment at RiteAid.com. Before we get out of here, I do want to touch on Jeff Carter's final game. Oh, yeah. Okay, was, can we just real quick on Risto? Yeah, before, yeah, 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 just, yeah, yeah. I, I forgot about I, that I already. do wonder if how much this does hurt his trade value yes. in the summer. Knowing that he had a major surgery, he's going to miss a significant amount of time in the offseason. You just said he's a guy who you think will be traded. I think they have probably had conversations with teams. I just wonder what this does to his value. God, you can't think it increases it, Charles. Yeah, you can't, I, can't think it probably helps. Actual, like, yeah. having an answer to the question is a lot better than not. That's, That's true. That's true. Like, true. But, like, there was always going to be an answer. It, it just eventually. they weren't giving us the answer. But, like, if the answer is, <laughs> yeah, we're not going to know until, like, September, and then he gets the surgery. Yeah, he, fair. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, I guess, like, it's not some hidden thing. Like, what's Ryan Ellis' injury? Yeah. Know, nipples to knees, all hurt. Yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess, yeah. Like, this is, this is everyone being colored by the Ryan Ellis situation and, and assuming that we were just never going to learn what happened with Risto. And the mystery, like the last couple seasons, beginning of the year, it's like, yo, he's going to miss the start of the season. Why? Uh, yeah. Like yeah. just that sort of like, I guess there's less mystery, but just in terms of a dude who's missed a ton of games the last few years, yeah. no, I can't mm -hmm. imagine it helps his value in that way. Can't help. Uh, Jeff Carter last night, it looks like he has wrapped up his, uh, his NHL career. He, uh, for, most recently played for the Pittsburgh Penguins last night, and he actually ended up scoring a goal the 442nd yeah, yeah. of his career. Uh, he ends up with 851 points in a uh, little over 1,300 games. He ended up with two cups in 133 playoff games in which he scored 47 goals and 84 points. He won a gold medal in the Olympics in 2014. He was a U18 champ, world junior champ. A Calder Cup with the Phantoms. He led those AHL playoffs in goals and points. I actually looked it up. I was like, was he the MVP? No, it was Nitamaki. Oh, um, yeah. Just a really wild career. And you look back at that 03, like the 03 draft was fucking incredible. It was really good. And yeah, like you could look at it and go, well, they could have taken this guy. They didn't get the pick wrong. No. Like they, this is, they got Carter at 11 and Richards at 24 in what was a really loaded draft. And I got just, I know he's been gone a long, long time. He, he played more games away from here than he played here, but he did play over 400 games in orange and black. And I will always wonder yes. what if they come back one more year? Yes. Just, I, I know maybe it was untenable. It, maybe those two were such a problem that you just could not do it. The team absolutely quit in that 2011 Boston series. You can never convince me about anything otherwise. But what if we're able to take a step back and go, Bob Rofsky didn't speak any English. His girlfriend couldn't get a green card. Yeah. Let's not give Briz 50 million bucks. Yeah. Yes, these two really need to grow up. And we knew that when we gave them their contracts. What if we let them try to grow up here? And like, there's just, you know, who loved to party the 70s flyers and yeah, they turned exactly. out all right, you they know? Right. Like, what if G is the guy and Richards and Carter can just be pieces the way they were in LA and, you know, he's G is the Kopitar? Like, God. what if we're able to accomplish the? I will always wonder about that. But it, it ends up, you know, he has a hell of a career, wins pretty much everything there is to win. And I wish it was here. I like, I'm wistful for those guys. And maybe it's just because everything we've been through since then. I don't remember how shitty it got at the end. Like, the whole locker room hated each other. But, like, 
man, we haven't had a team that good since. That is the Flyers team that I felt the most connected to and invested in. And that was in part because you were such a big Phantoms person, too. You got to yeah, see that yeah, Phantoms right. run with yes. them when they got called. And they I, got brought to the team. I don't know that I'll ever feel that kind of connection to a team again. I, I think as you get older, it's hard to really sure. like feel as connected no, to we're older a bunch than the players. Yeah, exactly. Now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So they were our age. Yeah. It's, I still wish he had scored that fucking goal in game six. That's, that's the one if, that for some reason, when I think of Jeff Carter, and I know it's shitty because he had a, a very good time here in Philadelphia, but that's the thing that I think of first. Like, if the, he the does, net was so wide open, dude. If he does, like, does he finish his career here last night? Like, he is it that simple? Maybe. Like, one thing changes everything? I don't know. I don't know. Also, they played the Islanders. The Penguins played the Islanders. The Islanders win. Hmm. Thanks, Torts. Um, hey, uh, well, I mean, well, the game was... But, well, so, so the one, Islanders' win song is Maxine Nightingale. Oh, okay. So it's get oh, right back no. where you started from. I'm like, you fucking started. Here's where you started. <laughs> like, and that's just... I was I was having an emotional... Yeah, between that seem, and all the coyotes. It seems like you were really going through your feels Between that on this. and all the coyote stuff, I yeah. was just having an emotional... I, I guess... I don't know. The, the one thing that's fascinating to me about the Carter Richards debate that we we will rehash forever, apparently, is just that, like, I think it's undeniable that that team's culture was bad bad it was not good no. they like you had like you had the pronger contingent you had the old city boys contingent yeah. they were constantly at war with each other they treated the, apparently treated the media like absolute garbage yes uh -huh. it was a fucking shit show and yet they almost won the stanley cup and then for two-thirds of the next season were like the best team they in, were in the president's trophy race until yeah. pronger was like i hate everyone and like, because he's he had like a broken wrist and was pissed off. Yeah. And, like, <laughs> everyone was just mad at each other, so they yeah. go get Christopher Steeg, and it was like, ah, shit, he fits in with the wrong crowd. And he also they <laughs> traded for him when he had a hernia. Yeah. So oh, like yeah. they never get got even close to 100 percent Christopher Steeg. I, I realize like everything that went wrong. I'll just always be wistful for it because nah, it was I'm it was an you. undeniably fun time I, to be a Flyers I guess fan. It sure it, it's funny because I don't have that same attachment. Like. Mm -hmm. the, my dream scenario for that situation is not don't trade Richardson Carter. It is don't sign Briz. It is yes. trade Richardson Carter, get Braden Shen and Sean Couturier and Wayne Simmons, and then stick with Bob. And then cross your goddamn fingers that because of the butterfly effect, that because you don't healthy. trade, you don't yeah. sign Briz, that somehow Pronger doesn't have his career ruined yeah. and you keep Chris Pronger. You have Claude Drew leading a team with Couturier and Simmons and Jen and still Chris Pronger and with Bob in net rather than the shit show that Briz was. And then suddenly you have Every, a Vesna quality yeah. goaltender oh. behind Every. a team with healthy Pronger and with Drew leading the way and with Young Town and Couturier and Shen and Simmons. That's my dream personally because I am not nearly as – and I loved Mike Richards especially, but I'm not nearly as attached to yeah. those guys. I'm more I, attached to – Guys like Shannon Simmons sure. and even Coots, although now I see him differently because I cover him. But like I was more attached to those guys as a fan than I was to Richardson Carter. I personally. will say in my scenario, we trade JVR for Simmons straight up. There you go. Yeah. Mm. But everyone mentions, and by butterfly effect, Pronger stays it. Like that's yeah. always the caveat, too. Of course. Because you like, need yeah, that one. Obviously. Yeah, you absolutely but need you that know, one. when you start thinking too much about that era, the number of ways that they could have gotten there and they just oh. did none of them yeah. right. It's it really like we could have we Man. could have gotten there back then. And like yeah. that first part of Holmgren's tenure was so, so good. It was so good. He did everything right for like two and a half years, and then like Yep. Yeah. Great, great have... first half All of right. GM tenure. Before we end, we have one William Gauthier making his NHL debut oh, tonight. Oh, William. I, I, I would like to hear. Okay. <laughs> are you two? Because I mean, I, I'm, I'm taking this from a reporter's standpoint. Are you two mm -hmm. actively rooting against him in his NHL career? Or is it a situation where, like, it's kind of like let it play out how it goes and he can just be the villain for the next 15 years of Flyers history. So I don't know that I'm actively rooting for him to suck, but I will say that if he does, I will enjoy it. Okay. I, uh, 
Like, it's good that he's 3,000 miles away. Yeah, we only got to play him twice. <laughs> like, I, yeah. I would love to, like, yeah. ask Danny and, and Jonesy. Like, were like, the Rangers calling? No, that's, that's <laughs> my exact scenario. Like, if they were like, yeah, we'll give you, um, it wouldn't be Lafreniere, but, like, we'll give you Kako in a first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, like, Drysdale. Maybe they just love Drysdale and he was the target and they zeroed in on him early. But would they have been like, yeah, we don't care where we trade him. <laughs> or was it? Being 3,000 miles no, away, a major yeah. part of this. Because, like, man, uh, he can't score against you all the time when he's in Anaheim. He can score five goals against you in a season at most. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, that's a huge season for him, and the two to three times we'll play them. If we see them in a final, we see them in a final. You know, it's it's not that he's not going to eliminate us from the playoffs yeah. outside of that. No. Um, also, for, just to, I don't know. just to, re, uh, to <laughs> rewind for a second, I want to stick with Gautier, but somehow I forgot Jake Voracek was in those trades too. So those yeah, four Jake, guys. Yeah. I, I want I want Jake Voracek in Philly. I do like him. Yeah, he's fun. Anyway, but back to Gautier. Back, yeah. but back to William. Am I actively rooting against him? Like, do I want him to get hurt? No. No. Do I want him? To not live up to expectations? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. One, I don't want him to be a 50 goal scorer. I, like if he's just Mike Hoffman, like rather yeah. than like a superstar sniper, that's yeah. fine with me. Well, somebody made an interesting point in our Discord. I believe it was uh, Jay Chime, who's a, a regular in yeah. our Discord, uh, made the point, which is is a it's a thought process that I never even like considered. But I get where this person's coming from. The argument was. I am actually kind of rooting for Gautier to be really good Ew. because it would make Jay Chime feel better about the Flyers scouts, that it would make them more trustworthy right. that they were able to identify a high-end player, which would, which would make shit. him feel better that they can find other guys in the draft that are also really good. Uh, when you're picking at five, you should get a high-end player. It, was it a stretch? It was like, a little bit of a stretch. Was it? All I right. mean, your check was the pick. Oh, that was right. that. That was the chalk pick, and they went Gautier. We have another super chat real quick before the right, end from this, Rory. Yeah. Did you see Ducks Twitter use Flyers caption from Jamie's first Flyers practice? Well played. Kelly, I know you retweeted that about the, the orange and black reference. They're going full troll. Yes, and I, I fell for it like an idiot. Um, but also... Steve from uh, Flight Purple. League. Yeah, for for those terrible jersey. For those listening who he aren't who aren't watching, uh, the tweet was all smiles to be in the right orange and black, and it's a picture of Gautier wearing Eat the shit. orange of the Ducks. To me, like whatever <laughs> troll. However, this reminds me how pissed I am that they took orange. Also, can we talk about? Dude, how you're, you're you're the mighty Ducks. Your colors are fucking teal, teal and, and white. Yes, they were they perfect. Had, they had the one of the best jerseys in the like league. They had objectively great jerseys. Yes. yes, and they chose to go with shit jerseys. Yeah. Like, like I can accept. And orange is mine. I can accept. Fuck you. I can accept <laughs> the Oilers using orange as a secondary because you know what All they've right. earned it. The Ducks. No, you can't use orange. No. Fuck you. Like in like eighties WHA, like orange works for them. Yeah, I, and it's I, a I secondary, can accept that. It's, it's a, a secondary, secondary color. color. When they had the like primary orange with just a little blue, that was asinine. No. But now that they're back to the regular blue with. Just yeah. orange no. accent. No, it's fine. fine. It's These, fine. Uh, no, it's horrendous. The, the, the ducks are not allowed to have orange as a color. No. I'm it's saying it right the now. Ducks. Also, Screw them. Oh my god. Go who back cares? To the good stuff. Can we talk about how William has serial killer eyes? There's like a, little, a little dead behind <laughs> oh, the see eyes. Where you there. Land on the <laughs> Scott, am I rooting against him? Am I rooting him? against him or for him? I'm rooting for him to go to prison for life. <laughs> 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 no, okay. I mean, like Perry, obviously. Yes. Um, but Scott Lawton eyes as well. Like I do love a guy with. I, I, I don't know. Eyes. I feel like he's going to be a problem for his entire career. We were talking about it before the show. Like he's going to be the guy that requests a trade at least twice. I, I love him. I do. I am I rooting against him? Yeah, because when I saw that pregame uh, before the national championship, oh, yeah. and he's like, "Yeah, there's going to be a lot of tears over on the other side." And, and then he says what he's going to score a couple William. goals, and yeah. they lose. They get shut. Like shut out. Oh, that's awesome. Oops. Like I was very happy about that. So yeah, yeah I can't. I can't. Um, no, I'm going to revel in any yeah. failure that he I'm has. I'm rooting against him. Just for fun. All right, well, we got him. our answers. Yeah.
I, I eh. this is what sports is. It's exactly. about grudges. Like I still hate the Ottawa Senators. Yeah, you do. Like you it's sure been twenty do. years. Claude Giroux's on the team. You yeah, still hate them. Well, yeah. yeah. No, I do love Jake. I do. I, it's a joke. I love Jake. <laughs> all right. Uh, did we do the super chat? We did. We okay. did. So that is all the time we have for you on PHLY. Thank you very much to our presenting sponsor, Mortgage CS. Uh, we love Mortgage CS. Hope you check out mortgagecs.com slash PHLY. Uh, and we'll be back tomorrow. You know where to find all of our stuff. Yeah, My name post, is, post Briere yeah. and Torts Press Big one tomorrow, so, yeah. actually. So you want to stay Excited tuned. To see what they Set say. those alerts so you don't miss the live show. My name is Bill Matz. That's Charlie O'Connor. That's Kelly Hinkle. Have a great week, Philly. We're all silly like the mayor. 